So Dallin did not have expressive language, and yet he led his life. He was a self-determined, uh, he had autonomy, which means he had control. And getting down on it, which I, that song to see, I'm singing it in my head now. I'm going to start, I'm bopping, I'm going to start bopping. And that is how he determined how he was going to communicate. He had up to seven different communication systems that he placed in the house. And he used differently for different people. If somebody didn't know sign language, then he would go get a communication device. And if they didn't have the tolerance for that device, then he would gesture. And if they didn't understand his gestures, then he would find a way to get his needs and his wants and his hilarity met. So that essence of that song, that that just get to it, just get on it and keep your rhythm in place. So Cool and the Gang also, they are also just so powerfully connected to one another. So that is, it's also a chapter in the book because it it always makes me smile. It does this and I get more wrinkles every time because I'm cracking up. That is the power of getting down and making sure people have the systems that they need. And Dallin demanded that of people. He did not tolerate people not understanding him or he would leave. He's like, I'm, I'm done. You can be here or I'm going. So get down on it by Cool in the Gang. Uh, cracks me up every time. It also brings me joy because Dallin did, he did find a way to communicate. Every day, every day of his life he did. Hey everyone, welcome back to Living the Next Chapter. I have yet another author on the podcast. And there's a musical connection to this author, which I love as a musician. So that's going to be exciting to talk about. And we're going to kind of go through and talk about, uh, again, the musical connection and what she's written. There's so much good stuff in here. I'm excited to have my guest on. Julia, welcome to Living the Next Chapter. So glad to have you here. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. This is a wonderful place to be. Great. Um, first of all, let's start with this. Your yard is all done nice because you've done all that work before getting on the call with me today. But where are you in the, this big world of ours? So I am in the Salt Lake City, Utah area. That's out in the western part of the United States. Beautiful. Um, that's an, a beautiful place. I've seen a lot of television shows and things filmed out there and um, it's just, it's so gorgeous out there. It's great. Yeah. We're surrounded by mountains. I'm closer to our West side of mountains than actually the big Wasatch. So we are close to all of it. 15, 20 minutes from either side of me. I can get to mountains. Wow. Yeah. Oh, now I'm super jealous. Yeah. Super jealous. It's beautiful everywhere. We have, we have one big hill here called Niagara Falls. That's right. <laughs> Um, that's really popular. Yes. People like water and hills, but mountains are something special. So that's great. Yeah. We have nothing compared to the Niagara Falls. We have a few little pretend falls out here. It's nothing. It's nothing what you <laughs> nothing guys have. Yeah. No. There you go. I love it. Um, now, okay. There's, there's a unique combination with what you've written and music. Before we get into your book, why... Why is music so important to you? And why is it so important to what you've written? So music is how our life strummed and drummed um, as we get into the story of this book and how it coincides with the life of our son. It also is how it stopped for me as the story goes. So when music came back to me, it's how these chapters are being written in my soul and in our family. So that's how music has always been. But when it paused, it also became an altering moment for me. So music now is such a, a stable part of me again, that that's what became so much a part of how I wrote this book. So there was a moment in time when music wasn't helpful. Correct. There was about three years, in fact, where I couldn't listen to music 
and it stopped. I didn't hear it on the radio. I didn't have it on in our home. And that was so different from what it had been before. So that's a part of how this story became. It's how this book became. And uh, it it sure caught me off guard when that happened because music was so a part of our lives and my life for all time before that. Okay, so let's jump in. This is for people that are hit and play on this going, oh, I don't know what this is yeah. about now. Or like, wait a minute, I'm going to put my phone away. I want to listen to this. Um, tell us kind of where the Orient, where's the story Orient from? How did this all come to play? Like, why is this book in the world? Yeah, so this book came by pure happenstance for me. It was not something I had dreamed of all of my life to become a writer. And the story begins many years before this, actually, in my first act. So I am actually in my third act right now. Um, my first act is when I was sure that life was going to go a certain way. I had everything planned. I was going to go travel the world. And then I met somebody, this really incredible human that I then got married to, and then in our second act, we had this really incredible person come. We had this child who came into our world and uh, brought joy and music more prominently into our world. And he was this powerful force of nature, and he, he loved music. He couldn't help but bop his head to it when he was a tiny little guy, and it just flowed with him. And then when he was almost two years old, he started having major seizures. And it turned into something that landed him in the hospital alongside of us for nine days. And it turned into this, what the doctors called a catastrophic illness, because it took all of his two years of development in a matter of moments. So the doctors were looking for answers, did series of tests. After many, many days, he had lost all of those skills. He couldn't sit up or walk or talk or even swallow very well. And they were not sure if he was going to survive. This was the beginning of a new world for us because before he was this bouncing, joyful little human of almost two years and the music stayed with him during this catastrophic illness. It's what kept him flowing. It's what kept us going, even though we didn't know if he was going to survive. And the most intriguing part of all of this time is his tenacity and his persistence to keep going, we think is a part of how he did survive the illness we did go home from that hospital and continue to learn again with him leading us. So his life changed after that, and so did ours. And the music stayed with us for the next many decades for him. He became this powerful force of just joy and abundance of, are you coming? Let's go play alongside a sheer amount of doctors and therapy and massive amount of, we have no idea what's going on, but we're sure going for it alongside of him. Music still kept him bouncing up the stairs as he was learning to walk again and communicate again. Although he didn't get spoken language back, he did communicate in a variety of ways, including sign language, and using communication systems, and also sending a dagger across the way with a look if you didn't get it right, which mm. when he was a teenager, we didn't get things right. And he would be like, ah, oh, you guys are blowing it because he was a teenager <laughs> and teenagers and parents, mm -hmm. sometimes you blow it, which, okay, we did. That's how it goes when you're a teenager. But music still kept him bopping along and he couldn't help it if you turned on the music and he would just come into it with this rhythm and I'm going to dance with you. And he did. 
So the music stayed with him during all of his recovery to a point with continued illness and disability. That was how we learned how to become this family again. We followed him. So the book came many years later after we had realized that he wasn't going to survive those illnesses. And he let us know that he didn't care if the illnesses were going to get super intense. He still came out of it like, let's do this. I'm here. Are you going to stay with me while I'm here? And by the way, if you can't stick with me, then I'm going to go. I'm just going to keep going. And he did for an additional 20 years after his original illness. So he was almost 22. And that's when he did have another series of illnesses and disability. But we're the ones who had to say, we're going to go with him. He never got caught up in whoa, what is me? Or, oh no, what are we going to do? It was always us who had to say, okay, he's just going to live this really grand life. And it was always with music, even alongside the doctor's appointments and all of the things he would put in the loudest music and eat the horrible food that he just loved. Like, really stinky chips. Okay, that's <laughs> the chips that are cheese flavored and a little mm -hmm. bit of garlic or I can't even describe how horrible the food was, <laughs> but he loved it. And so we bought it because that's what you do for somebody who's in their mid 20s. So mm -hmm. his illness and disability never got in his way, even as he was going through end of life because he chose to keep bopping into the next phase, even at end of life, because that includes life. And if we paused with it, then he's the one who said, I'm going. Are you staying with me? Let's go. And his medical team is the one who had to keep on top of, let's do this and follow his lead. And that doesn't mean we liked it. It means we were going to keep dancing to the mm. loudest music possible and let the windows shake. And <laughs> people looked at us strangely at red lights and that's okay. That's all right. So that's the beginning of it. The beginning and the middle are where we learn how to get into a rhythm and rhythms aren't always calm and full of unicorns. They're not always rainbows. Sometimes yeah. they're gnarly and beautiful still. That's what that was how it was written before I even knew that I was writing a story. Wow. Yeah. Like what? I love we talk about the fact that, you know, your son was faced with medical challenges and people telling him, no, you can't do this and no, you can't do that. And you got to take care of yourself and all these things. And he's just like, that's fine. I'm going to go do my thing. Yeah. And it doesn't matter what you say, but I'm going to live my life. And this is my life. And like, again, are you going to keep up with me or not? Like, come on, let's go. Yeah. Uh, I just, I, I see that you see you guys kind of, like one step behind him all the time as he wants to go and explore and do his things. You're just trying to keep up with him as instead of leading him, he's leading you in that sense. Right. For sure. We, even in his communication, learned communication to stay maybe a half a step in front of him to give him mm -hmm. the language, to give him any idea on how to let us know what he needed or what he thought about or what he needed to tell us a joke about or to step away and say, I don't think so. That is not going to happen. 
it wasn't always to agree. That's not what we do with communication. We can disagree with other people. And we we did our very best. And it didn't feel like we always succeeded with, with those things. And I think that's being a human at times that you don't feel like you are doing your very best. And, and that's what this book is about is, hi, that was a bugger. Now, Mm. here we go. So when he's young, like in the backseat of the car, grooving to the music, I'm sure there's one style of music he was liking at that young of age. But as he gets into his 20s, his musicals changes, I'm sure. His taste changes. Did you see any change in the the tone of the music? Like if he was having a, like not a good day compared to a, maybe a happier time? Did the music change at all for him? It did along the way. And there were times when I would try and introduce a new style of music and he would just shake his head and say, oh, <laughs> nope. I, that nope. is not going to happen. Specifically, and I don't even include this in the book because it would have been a thousand pages, but specifically mm-hmm. there was this brain science that Mozart or the classics was going to help with learning styles. Mm-hmm. And so I tried it and he he allowed it for a little while and would just shake his head. And then one day he went up and turned off the music took back in the day CDs, right? Took the Mm -hmm. CD out of the player, put it back into its case and stuck it in the back of (laughs) the array of CDs. And I just cracked up. He looked at me and said, no, (laughs) no. And I said, thank you for letting me know, right? It was one of those... That was an awesome try, Mom. It's not going to. So he preferred, you know, Tears for Fears. He preferred Bon Jovi. He preferred the stuff that you could really have the windows. Then he also liked Shania Twain sometimes. He also liked Neil Diamond. It was this really eclectic group of music. So, okay, that's what we did. He had to try it. It was, let's try it. Can you dance to it? Can it be hilarious? Can I, how loud can I get it to go and go from there? But Hmm. yeah, we did try a bunch. So for you personally, has music been important to you? Yourself? Yeah. And it has been throughout my life. I'm also one, this is probably where he got it, that turns up the music until the windows shake. And I do it now, and my neighbors probably shake their head. Like, you are an old, decrepit person. Why are you still doing that? And I do it going down the road. I've told my husband I need a better radio because I'm probably going to pop the speakers one day. And he shakes his head, like, listen, (laughs) listen. And I'm like, I am listening. The music is loud. So it is. It's been a rhythm for all of us. We clean the house to music going in the house. We work to music. It's how all of us go through life. So you have a unique, then go back to the intro when we started the podcast, there's a unique connection between what you've written and music yeah. that finds its way into your book. Can you talk a little bit about this? Because when we first met and had this conversation as a musician, I was so pleased to hear what you did in your book and how creative this is. Because I don't hear people talk about this as authors. And I think more people should because it's such a fabulous idea. What is the connection between the music, the sounds, and what you've written? What did you do? So 
I did mention that our son did pass away due to his illnesses and his um, disability. He had a complex life of ongoing needs. And when he did pass away, because music was so important, I couldn't listen to it. And then about three years after he passed away, the music came back. And I began to hear those songs that were so important to our life together. And it was those songs and those experiences together that came back to me. And I started writing the songs down on the back of receipts or on my hand when I was at a stoplight. And then the experiences would just start pulsing into my head. And I started to write them down. Thousands of words would come to me. And I thought, man, I got to get this out of me. It's just got to go somewhere. And so I did. Those memories, those experiences, those life intensities came back to me thousands and thousands of words at a time, and they were very specific. And as that happened, I was given an opportunity to present at a conference about very specific moments for people with disabilities and their um, the professionals that meet with them and family members. And I shared three of those songs and three of those experiences And people said, oh, no, this is much too hard. This is how we think. And I said, yeah, experiences are very timely for us. And often they are connected to a moment, a phrase or a song for us. And I walked away from that conference and thought, ah, I have to keep going. But I didn't tell anybody besides those very dear colleagues and friends And then I kept writing, and these songs turned into 22 chapters, very specifically. And that's it. Mm. It And that's all there were. And I thought, okay, good. I'm done. I had no intention of sharing them out from there. And then I did. I shared them with an editor that I had met. And he just grinned and said, you are in such trouble. And I said, no, I'm done. I'm done with it. And he said, you're not. You know Mm. that somebody else is going to need to hear this. And I said, but I can't. This is our son. And our son's name is Dallin. And I said, but this is Dallin's experiences. These are him. And he said, yeah, yeah, they are. And, And then he just grinned at me and I went, oh, no. This is horrible. And that was how it started to become more. And the title was there. And the the title of the book is The Boy Who Became More Than We Could Imagine. And part of that is because our son became more than most every professional or doctor had ever Mm -hmm. thought possible. From the beginning of the hospital stay, when they didn't know if he was going to survive, and then he surpassed all thoughts from ever being able to sit up again or walk again and then run to doing so much more, including tell a joke or walk away going, you guys are just so weird. And all of the (laughs) things from there, and that's how these stories became attached to the titles of the songs that led Mm -hmm. me into each experience so specifically with such amazement that I would get done with an experience and go, I have no idea where that came from, but I would take my hands off the keyboard and go, it's done. That's it. Of course, there's editing and all the mysteries that go with that. And yet, 22 of them have come into play without much addition or subtraction. And that became the book. Yeah. 
So you're a professional author. You write books all the time. This was just <laughs> another book on their list of many, right? You're an expert. You're a pro. You could teach writing authorship, right? Uh, That's you. That would it? be hilarious. No? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was, um, the trick is, is now there's two more books in me somewhere. And I'm like, oh, that is unimaginable because once the this one got done, two more are percolating in my mind, and I just sit back and go, that is hilarious. That is hilarious. And yet, apparently, there's more words to say. So does your book at all address that three-year gap when music wasn't what music was for you? Does it cover that, or is that a different thing? So it, uh, I do say that in the beginning of the book, but these okay. chapters are Dallin's experiences. There are Son's spaces from the time that he became or started with that illness when he was two years old. That's the start of this book, okay. and it starts with um, R.E.M. That's the mm -hmm. first chapter, is it's the end of the world as we know it. And, mm -hmm. and it was okay, because he did come through. He did survive the illness, and sometimes the end is also a beginning. As, as terrifying as it was, he did start to lead us as he had for his first two years as well, he was a hilarious two-year-old when he went into the hospital and he came out tenacious and resilient and let's go. Here we are. Mm -hmm. Grab it. Wow. Get the yeah. helmet. I'm going again. He needed support with walking at the time because he needed to relearn how to walk from that illness. And so he did. And it was beautiful and trepidatious and we had no idea what we were doing which turned out to be probably okay we were not able to surf the web or look up on google or do any of that stuff we we began when he was two and kept going from mm. there because as a parent listening to this who has lost their child who is in that period of three year period you talked about for yourself yeah. where, where music hurts, memories hurt, and they feel alone to hear you share your story helps them. So maybe somewhere in your future, you can maybe unpack that a little bit more to help parents when, when the music hurt. Yeah. Something along those lines, because that's a part of your story, I think, that could really help some parents as well. And I think as I have sat with it now, it's been 11 years since our son passed away. And those first moments, that new grief, that newness of, I didn't know what to do when we came home from the hospital. And that was a newness as well of we came into the hospital with one child, didn't know if he was going to survive and came home with another child. And that was new. And then when he passed away, it was new as well. And that's that new grief, that shockingness of I have no idea what to do. I've lost everything, yeah. including the music, including his essence. I didn't have that near me. I didn't know what to do, and nobody knew what to do alongside of us at that point. They were kind as possible. And the story, that's the next story. That's the next space of what do we do next because of the when you lose all of that. Our Dallin was no longer in our space, and yet he was everywhere. His, his essence was still permeating, and I wanted the music there. I wanted it, so I sought for it, and I just needed to be gentle with myself, and I waited. 
we don't know how to do that for one another. And so, yes, this first book is all about his story. In fact, somebody said that to me, wait, where's your story? Where are you in this? And I said, well, I'm everywhere in it. I'm the one who's driving and I'm doing this and we're doing this. And they said, but you're not in it. And I said, Mm -hmm. that's a good observation. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, well said. Well said. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking forward to whatever the next books are. I want to revel in this book, obviously, but I'm really following you with a lot of curiosity and anticipation of what is next for you. And please... I would love for you, when you find that next path, to come back and celebrate the future works that you do. Because again, this is living the next chapter, right? So coming back and celebrating, and so we can stay in step with you as your journey unfolds as an author, please consider coming back here and and talking more about that. I love that thought. Yeah. Okay. So we'll put a pin in that for sure. (laughs) Um. Out of all the chapters, the 22 chapters, is there a specific song right now in your mind that makes you really smile, that you're just like, oh, I can't wait for you to get to chapter whatever that is, because there's a really amazing story there that every time you think of it, just lights you Mm -hmm. up and takes you to that one happy place. A certain chapter stand out for you from the book? So I often get that question because this is an intense experience. This is an intense story. And I love chapter eight. So chapter eight is about water. And water for Dallin was where he felt his calm. It's where he became um, just joyful. When he was a teeny tiny boy and you got that little kiddie pool and you put an inch into it. And it was just like nirvana. It was, oh my gosh, the best thing ever. And then when he got a little bigger and the sprinkler came out and the holes went everywhere and mud, all the mud. And then it was, and it was (laughs) wonderful. I loved the mud. And it was also a little bit older when we found people who had boats. And then he found the joy of speed and how fast can I go on somebody's boat And we found people who owned boats and went so fast and then rode on the bouncies on the back and found one that didn't tip over. And people did try and tip over the untippable floaties on the back. So that's the chapter that is all joy. It's called Happy Happiness. And it's actually a Sesame Street song. And my gosh, Dallin loved Sesame Street. And it's one of those chapters that cracks me up every time because I can see him from this little teeny tiny one inch water loving toddler mm-hmm. all the way to the tall 20 year old. In fact, the t- the um, the photo on the front of the book, I'm going to pop it up really quick. Yeah, there that's you go. him nice. waiting for a boat ride. So he was holding up a tree. The tree's holding him up, actually. That was the last time he went on a boat. And he was just chilling. So the boat was supposed to be there. And he was had his lunch. And he was just kind of holding up the universe at that point. So that's the Mm. chapter. It's chapter eight. It's about water. But every chapter for me, just I can be just leaking, just having tears streak down my face and also grinning. That's the joy for me. But my gosh, we still love water. I still can sit by a pool with an inch in it or a lake that's massive Mm -hmm. and just be like, ah, this is grand. This is grand. As parents, we get the lovely opportunity for this human to come into our life and we feel like it's our job to teach our kids Mm -hmm. how to ride a bike, how to talk, how to do this, how to walk, how to eat. We teach them all these great things. But on the flip side, we become the student. Mm -hmm. They teach us more about ourselves as parents, as human beings. They leave us with lessons that make us better people. 
as parents. Yeah. What lessons did you learn from him that made you a better person? I think the one that he gave me was most importantly how to be present. And he did that with such exactness that he would take my hands into his head, like take them like this, or in the Mm -hmm. back of my head. And sometimes they were full of just goop or scrambled eggs or those horrible stinky chips. And I'd be like, oh, ah, like I would be on my way out the door to go to work. And then I would be full of whatever was on his hands. And he would just pull me close and sit and just, we would go forehead to forehead. In fact, uh, it turned out later as we paid attention, he learned that from Mr. Rogers, Daniel Stripe a Tiger, um, that mugga mugga, mugga mugga going forehead to forehead. And Dallin had this pause when he would do that and take your your head either in both hands or pull from the back of your head and he would touch you forehead to forehead. And it was this exactness of looking straight into your eyes. Mm. And then he would hold you there. And he, when he was losing strength at the end of his life and he was still so powerful. And I was like, how are you still this strong His hands were massive. He was six feet, four inches. And so when the title again is the boy who became more than we could imagine, and he's still this so strong, six foot four, incredibly tall and yet losing strength. And he would pull me in, look me straight in the eyeballs and, and you had to release and just let go and be present in this moment, that's what he taught. And if you had the ability to let go and be there, then he would like nod and go, okay, you are here. Mm. And there's one of the chapters when I um, talk about, am I getting this? Am I paying attention? Do I have the energy to be here and to do this? And sometimes it was terrifying to be with somebody that is at end of life. And it took a long time for him to go through this. And there are many things that we say we were given. And time is one of those If we have this energy to do this because it's really powerful, then we can say, okay, did I do everything great? Oh my gosh, no. I don't think we can do that exquisitely. And yet when Dallin would do his, I gotcha, hole Mm. in, then it was, I'm here right now. It would keep us present because the other side of that was thinking about all of the what ifs and this is coming and we're going to experience massive grief, which you can't even anticipate. There's no way to really know that and how grateful I am that he gave us that be here, be here because we had no idea. And we thought we did. We thought we knew what was coming. That's such a misunderstanding to think that we knew what was coming with with grief or what would it would it would feel like to have him not around us. We still sit back and go, "What is this? Why is he not walking down the hall? This is nuts. We're so baffled by it." Still, that's what he Mm. gave us was being present. And we still try and practice it today. Are we here? Are we here? Be right now. Whatever's coming will. 
can we do right now? Hmm. I feel like I'm in the room with you and Alan as he's holding your face and your forehead to forehead together. I can just, I feel like I'm just kind of like over on the couch watching this happen going, oh, it's, it's actually happening. Like I, it's happening right now. Like I feel like I'm there. What a beautiful picture. Like, did he do that for everyone or was that special for you guys? He didn't do it for everyone. There were others that he would not have the energy for. We had to make sure we brought good space. And if we had things happening like at our job or We had come from the store and it was super busy. We had to bring excellent, kind, graceful energy into our home because he was also very intuitive and would reflect back to us in an instant if things were intense. He would receive that and bounce it back like silly putty. Remember Silly Putty and you could put the, oh, the funnies. And so he would reflect it back to us. So if people came in and they had intense energy, he did not allow that. And so it wasn't everyone who got that, that um, pay attention. There were others who he would gently allow to leave the house quickly or leave the classroom, or he wouldn't go into some spaces or doctor's offices. He would just watch from a doorway and say, "Mm, no, not going in there. And we respected that every time. Other people needed to learn to respect that over a series of, he's not going to go into that room. And But not everyone got the forehead to forehead. Some people got Mm. different ways of feeling his deep energy. Some people got massive bear hugs. And again, he's 6'4", so towering, massive (laughs) bear hugs. And he had had a way, but that that, um, forehead to forehead perhaps was his direct channeling into me like, mom, you got to catch up. Come on. I have a little bit of time. What is taking you so long? Come listen to me. Yeah. Yeah. What a great kid. Like, oh, I wish I could have met him. But what I love, though, is that we have the chance to meet him and celebrate the things, the great things he's brought yeah. to your family, to to the world through this book. Do you think he would be proud of this book? I think he would find it intriguing and maybe be curious about the perspective. I think there are some things that he'd be like, "All right, sure, sure." He he was a <laughs> he was a powerful human. And he was also very kind and lived a lot of gnarly moments. And perhaps, perhaps his kindness would have, would have been like, okay, that works out. Sure. Okay. I love it. Uh, Can you just like block off the rest of your week so we can just keep (laughs) recording? Cause I love talking to you about this. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you have things to do. Uh, Julia, uh, as far as I have one more question I want to end off with our our conversation. Again, please, the doors open as your journey continues as an author and the next book comes out and whatever. I want you to come back, please, because I think our community is going to love to hear updates and follow your journey as you write. So please keep that in mind. Um, But I have one more question for you at the end. But before we do that, where we can connect with you, where we can get the book. Uh, where you're most active online, because I know there's going to be people wanting to reach out to you. I have friends who have podcasts who listen to this show and then steal all my guests, which I love. <laughs> so they're going to want to reach out to you um, to, to carry on the conversation. Where do we connect with you? And then I want to ask my last question at the end. So one of the best ways to find me is on my website. That's juliapierce.net. And that's P-E-A-R-C-E dot net. 
Uh, you can find my book there or on Amazon. It is available there. And um, I think I'm also on Instagram, Facebook. Uh, I have a YouTube channel and I'm on LinkedIn. Excellent. So you have no excuse for not being able to connect <laughs> with Julia. Julia, if we could go to Spotify, and what I like that is that you have all these songs referenced for the chapters. So my suggestion is to listen to the song for the chapter before you read the chapter. So you're in the right headspace to understand why that song relates to that specific chapter. So that's my suggestion to everyone listening. But if we could go today to Spotify or Apple or YouTube, wherever we get our music, and press play on one song that you would suggest that your son would tell us we need to listen to today, one song that we could all go listen to at the end of this podcast, what would be that one song that you would say is a either one of his favorite songs or a song that really captures the spirit of your son? Is there any names, any song names or titles that come to mind that we could then send people to listen to? So the one that probably is most important because it's how he led his life is Get Down On It by Cool and the Gang. <laughs> I love that song. Okay, explain, explain. So Dallin did not have expressive language and yet he led his life. He was a self-determined uh, he had autonomy, which means he had control and getting down on it, which I, that song to see, I'm singing it in my head now. I'm going to start. I'm, yeah, oh my. I'm going to start yeah. bopping. And that is how he determined how he was going to communicate. He had up to seven different communication systems that he placed in the house and he used differently for different people. If somebody didn't know sign language, then he would go get a communication device. And if they didn't have the tolerance for that device, then he would gesture. And if they didn't understand his gestures, then he would find a way to get his needs and his wants and his hilarity met. So that essence of that song, that that just get to it, just get on it and keep your rhythm in place. So Cool and the Gang also, they are also just so powerfully connected to one another. So that is, it's also a chapter in the book because Good. It, it always makes me smile. It does this and I get more wrinkles every time because I'm <laughs> cracking up. That is the power of getting down and making sure people have the systems that they need. And Dallin demanded that of people. He did not tolerate people not understanding him or he would leave. It's like, I'm, I'm done. Mm. You can be here or I'm going. So get mm -hmm. down on it by cooling the game. Uh, it cracks me up <laughs> every time. It also brings me joy because Dallin did, he did find a way to communicate every day, every day Love of it. his life he did. And he's still doing it today. He apparently is. He has a lot of presence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he does. Thank you for writing this book. Thank you for being obedient to people saying, hey, you got to write this. No, no, no. Yes, no, yes, you do. You got to share this because, A, we've had the chance to meet, yes. and my life's better because of your son's story. And I think all of us that are listening have a new connection, somebody that we can we can learn from. Your son's message continues. That's the legacy of what you've done. You've shared that message, and now we all get the chance to have a little inside scoop and little inside glimpse into the, the wonderful uh, life you've had with your son. So thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you for having me. What a great conversation. I love it. Everyone, your homework right now is to go listen to Get Down On It from Cool and the Gang. <laughs> you have to do that right now. Um, we will have a link to the song in the show notes so you can click it. Everyone has to listen to that song, okay? Julia's going to go listen to it right now. I'm going to go listen to it right now. Going to go dance around the room. I'm a terrible dancer. So I'm going to I'm not going to let you see that part. Um but uh, you know everyone has to go listen to that song right now. 
everyone needs to go buy the book. Leave a great review on this book so everybody knows about this book. And Julia's going to come back in the future to update us on what's next as she lives her next chapter. Julia, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. It was wonderful. Hey, thanks for listening all the way to the end of the podcast. That's a big signal to all of the players, the YouTubes, the Apples, the Spotify's that you found value in this episode of Living the Next Chapter. Just by you listening to the end, you just sent a huge bat signal out to the app saying this was a great podcast, a great conversation. So you listening to this point, you've done your job. I have one more ask of you. If you know anyone anyone that would benefit from this conversation would you share this episode with them would you just get on send them a message send them the episode tell them about this episode tell them to a living in the next chapter.com to get all the information about the podcast can you do that for me because the more people that hear this message this episode the better i want to support these amazing authors and i know you do as well So sharing this episode really helps. And I appreciate you. See you on the next episode. And thank you for listening to Living the Next Chapter.